Welcome to Idlewild Cottage, a quiet place where kindred spirits can linger together over a cup of tea, savoring all things lovely and cozy. My name is Juliana, and I'm delighted to have you. Each episode here at the cottage will center around a theme. That theme will be celebrated in a number of ways, through literature, art, nature, and even some favorite movie scenes, we'll cherish the sweet and simple things of life. So make yourself at home, and I'll put the kettle on. As autumn steals quietly on and the days shorten, our attention shifts to embrace the cozy indoor rhythms of home. One of these rhythms, both by necessity and by delight, is that of gathering around the table. This gathering may be as formal as a company meal, crowded with guests and overflowing with delectables, or it could be as simple as bread and cheese before the fire. Today, we'll peek into several feasts, imagining our way through an entire day, from breakfast through dinner. Before we begin, though, I must warn you, you may want to have a snack on hand, for if you're anything like me, or Philippa Gordon, Reading of food always makes one hungry. And who is Philippa Gordon? Anne Shirley's college chum from Anne of the Island. On this occasion, Phil reacts to the book Anne is reading, The Pickwick Papers. That's a book that always makes me hungry. There's so much good eating in it. The characters always seem to be reveling on ham and eggs and milk punch. I generally go on a cupboard rummage after reading Pickwick. And if you've read the Pickwick papers too, you know she's absolutely right. Okay, if you have your snacks at the ready, let's start bright and early with this mouth-watering breakfast from Farmer Boy, which is an especially hungry book. When Almanzo trudged into the kitchen, Mother was making stacked pancakes because this was Sunday. The big blue platter on the stove's hearth was full of plump sausage cakes. Eliza Jane was cutting apple pies, and Alice was dishing up the oatmeal as usual. But the little blue platter stood hot on the back of the stove, and ten stacks of pancakes rose in tall towers on it. Ten pancakes cooked on the smoking griddle, and as fast as they were done, Mother added another cake to each stack and buttered it lavishly and covered it with maple sugar. Butter and sugar melted together and soaked the fluffy pancakes and dripped all down their crisp edges. That was stacked pancakes. Pancakes await another group of farmers in the 1954 film Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Millie is determined to teach her new brothers-in-law to behave like civilized gentlemen. She lures them with a hearty breakfast in exchange for them shaving and giving up their grimy clothes to be washed. Well, the smell that greets them, along with Millie's tempting menu, is enough to prompt their glow up. Good morning, my brothers. I got hot muffins waiting, crisp bacon, hot cakes, steak, fire potatoes, fresh ground coffee. These cozy 19th century farm scenes bring to mind an 1880 painting by Frederick George Cotman titled One of the Family. Mother, grandmother, and children are already seated around the table. Grandmother is slicing away at a loaf of bread, the children intent on the spread. Father is hanging up his things preparing to join them, And the family horse peeks through the Dutch door where he is treated to a morsel from Mother's outstretched hand. I'll include a link in the show notes to this charming scene. Well, after these hearty breakfasts, it's hard to imagine ever being hungry enough for lunch. But if we're as active as the Walker children in Arthur Ransom's Swallows and Amazons, then the seaworthy fare is just the thing following a row on the lake. John and Roger ran to the harbor, cast off Swallow's moorings, and scrambled in. John paddled her out through the narrows and then began rowing to the landing place. Susan and Titty were waiting there with a tin of pemmican, a tin opener, 
a knife, a loaf of bread, a hunk of butter wrapped up in a bit of paper, and four large apples. After stopping by the store to pick up ginger beer, which our intrepid sailors call their grog, our adventurers finally make their way toward the island where they stop for lunch. A rock on the top of the islet made a table. John opened the pemmican tin and jerked it till the pemmican came out all in one lump. Susan cut up the loaf and spread the butter. On the hunks of bread and butter, they put hunks of pemmican and washed them down with grog. Then they ate the apples. Now, perhaps pemmican and grog aren't quite your cup of tea. If that's the case, then by all means, let's take a trip to Echo Lodge, where we'll spend the afternoon with Anne, Diana, and sweet Miss Lavender. From Idlewild Cottage, we'll make our way on this bright autumn day toward the stone cottage, where Lavender Lewis eagerly awaits our arrival. I have tea all ready for you. Will you go up to the spare room and take off your hats? I must run out to the kitchen and see that Charlotte the Fourth isn't letting the tea boil. Charlotte the Fourth is a very good girl, but she will let the tea boil. While Miss Lavender trips off to the kitchen, we'll slip into the spare room, leave off our hats and dusters, and then make our way back toward the kitchen. There we'll find Miss Lavender carrying the teapot, and behind her, looking vastly pleased, is Charlotta the Fourth with a plate of hot biscuits. Miss Lavender is the epitome of hospitality. Just let's sit comfortably down and eat everything. Charlotta, you sit at the foot and help the chicken. It is so fortunate that I made the sponge cake and donuts. And then, after a merry and memorable meal, will saunter out to the garden, lying in the glamour of sunset. The glamour of sunset ushers in our next meal, which takes place at Hartfield, hosted by Emma Woodhouse and her father. Readers of Jane Austen's Emma can't help but giggle over Mr. Woodhouse's rather paranoid ways. Upon such occasions, poor Mr. Woodhouse's feelings were in sad warfare. He loved to have the cloth laid, but his conviction of suppers being very unwholesome made him rather sorry to see anything put on it. And, while his hospitality would have welcomed his visitors to everything, his care for their health made him grieve that they would eat. Such another small basin of thin gruel as his own was all that he could recommend— though he might constrain himself, while the ladies were comfortable clearing the nicer things, to say, Mrs. Bates, let me propose your venturing on one of these eggs. An egg boiled very soft is not unwholesome. You need not be afraid. One of our small eggs will not hurt you. Miss Bates, let Emma help you to a little bit of tart, a very little bit. I do not advise the custard. Mrs. Goddard, what say you to half a glass of wine? A small half glass put into a tumbler of water? I do not think it could disagree with you. Emma allowed her father to talk, but supplied her visitors in a much more satisfactory style and had particular pleasure in sending them away happy. Let's linger with Austin a bit longer and with some more laughter as we recall the Bennett family's meal with Mr. Collins. Now, this whole scene is hilarious no matter how it's told. In the original text, the films... Well, today, let's look to the iconic moment in the 2005 film. Mr. Collins is as presumptuous as ever, hoping to impress his lovely cousins and win one of their hands in marriage. Amid the quiet clink of utensils, the awkward lull in conversation and his obvious appraisal of his cousins, Mr. Collins ventures. What a superbly featured room and what excellent boiled potatoes. It's been many years since I've enjoyed such an exemplary vegetable. To which of my fair cousins should I compliment the excellence of the cooking? While these evening meals are all quite elegant and formal, I think the one I'd most enjoy being a part of is Sunday night dinner 
at the Ray home. Our hearts warm as we step into this family tradition in heaven to Betsy. Sunday night lunch was an institution at the Ray house. The meal was prepared by Mr. Ray, a custom of many years standing. No one else was allowed in the kitchen except in the role of admiring audience. First, he put the coffee on. He made it with egg, crushing the shell and all into the pot, mixing it with plenty of coffee and filling the pot with cold water. He put this to simmer and while it came to a boil, slowly filling the kitchen with delicious coffee fragrance, he made the sandwiches. He got out a wooden breadboard and a sharp knife. He sliced the bread in sensibly thick slices. The butter had been put to soften and now, around the breadboard, ranged everything he could find in the icebox. Sometimes there was cold roast beef, sometimes chicken, sometimes cheese. If nothing else was available, he made his sandwiches of onions. He used slices of mild Bermuda onions, sprinkled with vinegar and dusted with pepper and salt. The onion sandwiches were most popular of all with the boys who flocked to the Ray house. Old and young gathered in the dining room around the table. The big platter of sandwiches was placed in the center. A cake sat on one side and a dish of pickles on the other. There was the pot of steaming coffee, of course, but the sandwiches were king of the meal. There was always a fire in the dining room for Sunday night lunch. Almost everyone ended there with a second cup of coffee and cake. Let's cozy around the fire ourselves and close with a simple evening snack inspired by Heidi's first meal with her grandfather. The old man kindled a bright fire. The water began to boil in the kettle. Now the old man held a large piece of cheese with a long iron fork over the fire and turned it round and round till it was on all sides of a golden yellow. Heidi watched with great attention. Then, suddenly, she ran to the cupboard, going back and forth. The grandfather came now with a pot and the cheese to the table, where already lay a round loaf of bread and two plates and knives, all neatly arranged, as Heidi had noticed everything in the cupboard. The grandfather filled a mug with milk, which Heidi drank without stopping. Do you like the milk? asked the grandfather. I never drank such good milk before, answered Heidi. Then you must have more. And the grandfather filled the mug to the brim and set it before the child who was eating her bread with delight after she had spread it with the soft cheese, for it was soft as butter. She now and again drank her milk and looked quite happy. As we savor mountain goat cheese spread over a hearty crust of bread, feeling quite happy, let's turn to the familiar words of Psalm 23, where we are reminded of the Lord's abundant provision in our lives. You prepare a table before me. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Kindred Spirits, as October comes to a close and November takes center stage, would we be mindful of God's goodness in our lives? Indeed, our cup, like Heidi's, overflows. Thank you for joining me today, dear ones. Please come again soon to Idlewild Cottage. <laughs>